the origin which is sort of still mysterious so you will realize when i put the next slide why i am saying it is mysterious it's a multifactorial problem starting from the ectopic endometrial tissue which can reach the ectopic area mechanically through a retrograde menstruation or through metastasis in fact there was an extreme thought that endometriosis could be a some sort of a neoplasia or a cancer but the difference between endometriosis and a real cancer is that in cancer after metastasis in the new area the cells will multiply in a bizarre way unchecked way but that does not happen in case of endometriosis otherwise the metastasis can occur through lymphatics through the blood uh, and in other means as well direct spread also whatever it is ectopic endometrial tissue is a must to diagnose endometriosis but why should an ectopic ectopically situated endometrial tissue flourish that may be because of an altered immunity altered immunity has again lots of mechanisms today i don't want to bore you all with that then there is a imbalanced cell proliferation so it is not exactly bizarre proliferation or a unbalanced or a unchecked proliferation it's a imbalance in the proliferation of the cells that's why it is different then there is a apoptosis mechanism also which exactly is happening in case of cancer then there is an aberrant endocrine signaling for an endometrium which is situated outside it needs endocrinal support to flourish also new vessels to flourish so all these things happen in favor of endometriosis that is aberrant endocrine signaling and of course no disease can be talked without invoking genetic factors there are six genomic regions that are situated with endometriosis so it's a combination of all these things that's why endometriosis as well as adenomyosis they are not simple problems the more we dig into it the more things that are coming uh, to the light so let us straight away jump into clinical features because all of us know about different theories and stages and all those things the clinical features especially with respect to adolescence i am talking today it depends upon the site depth of lesion and they do not always correlate with the extent of the disease the famous five d's that all undergraduate students know that is dysmenorrhea especially the triple dysmenorrhea dyspareunia dyskasia dysuria and dull aching pain is hallmark of endometriosis in fact you will see in my future slides that this alone is enough to diagnose endometriosis i remember teaching undergraduate students that diagnostic laparoscopy is a must to diagnose endometriosis and that's a gold standard no more you are going to soon come across that slide in the talk menorrhagia is a big problem for adolescents with endometriosis sometimes you may not find anything but there may be endometriosis which may increase the congestion in the pelvis and that's the cause of menorrhagia the patient may also be having adenomyosis and fibroid and all the three can coexist infertility of course is not an issue with adolescents unless there is a teenage uh, marriage and things like that about 30% of patients are asymptomatic this is a very very important thing so they may not manifest in adolescent period but later in life once they get married or later after marriage or few years after marriage they may have all symptoms of endometriosis but initially they may not have so i am deleting the dyspareunia part and infertility part when i talk about adolescent endometriosis as i was just talking the ishre february 2022 guidelines this is the latest the diagnosis is 
no longer dependent on laparoscopy. In fact, they have gone to the extent of saying laparoscopy is no longer the diagnostic gold standard. I would slightly change this sentence, of course, with due apologies, that you cannot say diagnosis, I mean, laparoscopy is not a gold standard. Probably what we must say is that laparoscopy is not the first line tool in the diagnosis. I think that would be a correct statement to make. It is now only recommended in patients with negative imaging results. We all know ultrasound is good provided there is a chocolate cyst. If it is simple additions or the early uh, markers of endometriosis and powder burn marks, these things cannot be seen by ultrasound. But we can diagnose even very small cysts by imaging techniques, maybe ultrasound, high resolution, or even MRI. And or, or where empirical treatment was unsuccessful or inappropriate. Now, I am bringing in a new concept here. I mean, it's not me, the Ishray. Empirical treatment. You all can recall that in olden days, even you, today also, tuberculosis is sometimes diagnosed because of empirical treatment. Even so-called CBNAT, which has got very good sensitivity and specificity, it can diagnose only 50 to 60% of the cases, especially of genital tuberculosis. So in others, it's just a hunch or an empirical treatment. After six weeks, she suddenly starts improving. So that proves the diagnosis of tuberculosis. Similarly, in endometriosis, just based on the symptoms, you have a hunch that this could be a case of endometriosis without doing diagnostic laparoscopy and with a negative ultrasound, you simply start with the treatment of endometriosis and the patient responds. That itself is diagnostic as per Ishre February 2022 guidelines. I hope I'm clear in that. Now, what is recommended as far as diagnosis is concerned, a good symptom dairy. A thorough questioning, whether the patient has triple dysmenorrhea, whether she has got additional dysuria, dyscasia, dull aching pain, such a diary is definitely going to be useful, especially in early diagnosis. For deep infiltrating endometriosis, vaginal endoscopy, instead of going for a laparoscopy, vaginal endoscopy is now being recommended, but it has got low diagnostic accuracy. As I said earlier, ultrasound or MRI, even if it is negative, they do not exclude endometriosis. So that's where the empirical treatment comes into picture, not for just treatment. It is treatment plus diagnosis, both. One minute, just. Nishit, I'm giving a lecture in the webinar. I'll call you after that. Okay, sorry, sorry. So laparoscopy only if either of above are not diagnostic. And histopathological evidence after doing a biopsy at laparoscopy is negative, does not exclude the diagnosis. So Ishre has given us enough freedom to just diagnose endometriosis with suspicion or with an empirical treatment or with just ultrasound. Diagnostic laparoscopy is the last resort now. It's not the first resort. Obviously, in adolescents, you wouldn't like to do a laparoscopy, such an invasive procedure. Even vaginal endoscopy is not required. What is definitely not recommended is biomarkers. These bio, There are plenty of biomarkers, starting from CA-125. They are all in the experimental stage now. So there is no need to do biomarkers as per Ishray. There is no evidence as far as following up and also psychiatric support when diagnosed early, although benefits are questionable. So there are mainly two problems with endometriosis. Number one is infertility. Second one is pain. Today, I'm not at all going to talk on infertility because I'm going to talk on medical management, especially with respect to adolescents. 
So where the main problem is pain and the management of pain. So I'll concentrate myself on managing the pain. Before I go on, we need to understand the mechanisms of pain. Only then can we tackle it. Otherwise, it will be like a simple analgesic that you take for a common headache. There are three mechanisms. Number one is nociceptive pain. This is in response to noxious stimulus from a chocolate cyst or chocolate material. Obviously, this has to be removed mechanically. Then only the pain will be reduced. But is that enough? No. There is a second mechanism that is inflammatory pain. As I said earlier, the difference between neoplasia and inflammation with respect to endometriosis is very thin. So there's a big dilemma whether to categorize it under neoplastic disease or inflammatory disease. But now, as of now, we think that it is an inflammatory disease. So this is the reason why there is pain in endometriosis in response to tissue injury and resulting inflammatory process. The third mechanism of pain is neuropathic pain, which is produced by damage to the dysfunction of the neurons. So unless you tackle all these three mechanisms, patient will continue to have pain and she gets frustrated and she will blame the doctors and keep changing the doctors. And also we must remember endometriosis is a marathon race. It's not a sprint. It will stay with the patient right from adolescence to menopause. Thankfully, unlike other chronic diseases like diabetes and hypertension, it sort of ceases after menopause. So till such time, we have to run a long race. So it cannot be like a band-aid treatment. We have to counsel the patient, prepare the patient for a long haul. Otherwise, she gets frustrated very quickly. And we also get frustrated with the patient very quickly. So the standard care for pain, that's why in endometriosis, number one is surgery plus medicine. Of course, it doesn't sound something mysterious. All that we have is surgery and medicine. But does surgery relieve pain totally? I have already told you that surgical destruction or removal of endometriotic lesions significantly reduce perception of clinical pain. But there was incomplete pain relief proving that the pain with endometriosis is not just nociceptive, but it also involves inflammatory and neuropathic mechanisms. So we have to address them. What are the problems with surgery? Number one is recurrence. We have seen within two to three months, sometimes the chocolate cyst comes back and the patient thinks that doctor has not done a good job. I'm sure Vidya will bail me out on this. So a recurrence will ask for repeat surgeries. When you repeat surgery, obviously there will be difficulty during surgery because of additions and things like that. And obviously the complications will increase. And then you need an expert like Vidya or Modi or something like that. And then the high cost. The cost will increase as the number of surgeries increase. So that's why the Practice Committee of American Society for Reproductive Medicine has said that Endometriosis is a chronic disease that requires lifelong management with the goal of maximizing medical treatment and avoiding repeated surgery. Especially with respect to endometriosis, it is said that the first surgery has to be the best surgery and it has to be the complete surgery. Still, there can be recurrence. And then, of course, even in the expert's hand, the surgery will be incomplete, if not complicated. Does that mean medicine has the final answer? No, there are problems with medicine as well. First of all, failure to respond or poor response. That will give only temporary relief and frustrate the patient. So you can't use the same drug for long you will change the drugs. And when you change the drugs, there will be undesirable side effects that will make the patient stop taking drugs. 
that is non-compliance and you will use all sorts of off-label drugs so let us now understand how to tackle endometriosis successfully i already told you there are three mechanisms number one is nociceptive for that nothing short of surgery but for the other two inflammatory and neuropathic pain we highly depend on medical management now let us understand which medicines would be better as far as inflammation goes we all know prostaglandins play a big role they are the mediators of inflammation directly activate nerve endings to pain prostaglandins are known for this they trigger the release of other algesic mediators like histamine serotonin ngf and prostonates as well from other cells and afferent nerves so stimulating finally peripheral nerve sensitization they also stimulate this is very important statement they also stimulate aromatase enzymes that favor the continuous formation of estradiol it is like friends of the same feather they flock together prostaglandin will help in the formation of estradiol because estradiol later helps the formation of prostaglandins let us see how we all know the one of the important pain killers is cox inhibitor so we need to understand what is the role of cyclooxygenase cyclooxygenase is the rate limiting enzyme that catalyzes the initial step in the formation of prostaglandins from arachidonic acid we have already understood prostaglandins are the mediators of inflammatory pain now cox is the enzyme that helps in the formation of prostaglandin from arachidonic acid cox especially cox2 is induced by endometriosis and leads to higher levels of prostaglandins look at this endometriosis itself induces the cox2 and cox2 helps the in the formation of prostaglandin which is the main cause of pain now cox2 is stimulated by estradiol now you know why i was telling estradiol helps in the formation of prostaglandin indirectly so shall we put it together estradiol helps in the formation of cox2 cox2 helps in the formation of prostaglandin prostaglandin is the final culprit in the pain so let us look at the estrogen now we all know hyperestrogenic state is the common factor behind endometriosis fibroids and adenomyosis so estrogen acting as a neuromodulator that selectively repulses the sympathetic axons while preserving sensory innervation so here is a perfect vicious circle number 1 prostaglandins stimulate aromatase enzyme this will increase the estradiol estradiol stimulates cox2 formation now cox2 is a catalyst in the formation of prostaglandin so all three of them form the vicious circle one helping the other other helping the at another at another helping the other so they keep helping each other and then the patient will have the pain we have to break this nexus dirty nexus how to break the dirty nexus so that's where comes the medical management of endometriosis surgery is not going to break this nexus surgery is only going to remove the nociceptive irritating material so the concept of medical management includes suppressing the estrogen because of hyperestrogenism as you have seen there cox2 is formed and cox2 forms the prostaglandin prostaglandin encourages estrogen formation so it keeps on happening like that so somewhere you have to break break it by suppressing the estrogen number 
we also should stop the formation of or the deposition of endometrial cells outside the uterine cavity so we have to reduce the retrograde spill again to achieve this we use progesterone so, so progesterone will not only antagonize estrogen it will also stop the retrograde spill by decreasing the amount of endometrium we have to side by side overcome the progesterone resistance if any and then for the immediate relief of pain ultimately whatever may be the actors behind the scene the one who is really giving us pain is the prostaglandins and that has to be tackled by using anti-inflammatory agents we have to stop the production of estrogen by suppressing the aromatase enzymes by using aromatase inhibitors we have to also use anti-angiogenic this is the one thing that we all use in a in a very very high uh, uh, order that is suppressing the formation of new vessels which will support endometriosis then finally we have to do some amount of immunomodulation because you saw in the very first slide the altered immunology is one of the causes of endometriosis so medical management includes hormonal treatment that is suppressing the estrogen using progesterone or other stronger drugs plus or minus mostly plus non-hormonal treatment now as far as hormonal treatment goes right from my undergraduate days this is imprinted in my mind that is it is aimed to suppress the lesions and it is best achieved by menstrual suppression and the choice of course is individualized the traditional concept is pseudo pregnancy regime which mainly consists of progestins or pseudo menopausal regime which consists of gnrh agonist now you are seeing danazol is in gray color that is because now it is no more favored ishray 2022 guideline the same one which i quoted earlier says that studies on gnrh antagonist treatment support their use as an additional second line treatment options so you can use agonist basically but now the evidence is antagonist also can be used as a second line treatment option danazol is no longer included in the recommendations so non hormonal agents include nsaids basically and they are beneficial for pain relief and reduce the bleeding also when used concomitantly with oral contraceptive pills so traditionally we use the thromboxane and mefenamic acid combination so that would help reduce the bleeding also when you reduce the bleeding obviously retrograde bleeding will also stop so there is no fresh implantation pentoxyphaline is another anti-inflammatory as well as immunomodulator that has shown some promise and finally for neuropathic pain we use gabapentin that is anti-epileptic alone or in combination with amitriptyline which is an antidepressant for neuropathic pain so non-hormonal consists of NSAIDs pentoxyphaline and gabapentin you may use one after another concomitantly or concurrently so to summarize to mild to moderate pain with no endometrioma to be tackled by surgery you can use NSAIDs which includes cox2 inhibitors mefenamic acid both of them are helping each other cox2 inhibitors will stop stimulating or production of the prostaglandin mefenamic acid is a direct antagonist of the prostaglandin you can use continuous cocs nowadays the low dose pills can be used for 84 days they can also be used for more than that one or two days so this can be used and of course the most popular drug that is dinogest people have also used mpa norethindrone because we need all of them we it's a long battle as i told you 20 years we have to treat the patients so you may have to keep changing the drugs i have to dedicate one slide to dinogest which is usually given 2 milligrams daily it inhibits prostaglandin e2 production and aromatase 
That's what we wanted. It also inhibits angiogenesis and vascular proliferation. Again, welcome. It reduces endometriotic lesions. This is the best part of it. Without surgery, you can at least shrink the endometriosis. In fact, one of the Japanese professors in one of the webinars, he was telling total, total disappearance of the cyst, which is very difficult for me to believe because I've never seen that. But definitely there, is, there will be a shrink from five centimeters to three centimeters, two centimeters has been seen. It effectively alleviates pain because of all these actions and it improves indices of quality of life. I remember a lady who was almost suicidal. She suddenly got so much of relief with this Dynagest and she was cheerful after just three months of taking this. It is safe and tolerable up to 65 weeks. You can give continuously for 65 weeks. In fact, the same Japanese professor was telling he has given for five years continuously. High rates of patient compliance with Dynagest. Though the side effects are very, very few. So many of the patients just love this. For severe pain, again, with no endometriomas, you can use NSAIDs, of course, but you require a higher or stronger uh, anti I mean, progestols, that is GnRH antagonist, I mean, agonist. When you use such uh, high doses, then you have to give add back therapy with a little bit of estrogen or OC pills containing low dose estrogens. Women whose pain does not respond to the above may be offered laparoscopy. Maybe there are some additions which have to be tackled, maybe deep infiltrating endometriosis requires surgery only, or there are some erythematous patches which require coagulation, or maybe there is an endometriotic cyst which was missed. The hormonal treatment. A systematic review of 40 RCTs said it can reduce pain when given a diagnosis. A diagnosis. It, adverse effects are, of course, common, especially with dinosaur, GnRH analogs, and DMPA. All of them will give rise to like postmenopausal symptoms. OCPs are less effective than GnRH, but less likely to reduce the bone mineral density or cause postmenopausal symptoms. It reduces the pain and other symptoms when given for six months after conservative surgery. That means it can be given at diagnosis before surgery. It can also be given after surgery up to six months. So hormonal treatment is really, really useful. Now, if a patient is tired of taking progesterone for a long time, we have got alternatives for that. Or if the patient is not uh, liking this progesterone, or if it is not effective, we can use ethinyl norgestrinone. I have no idea about this. I have not used this. So also etonorgestrel implants, I don't think it is available yet. But definitely what is available for all of us is levonorgestrel intratent device. You may ask me a question. Can it be used in adolescents? My answer would be, why not? Nowadays, we are prescribing LARC, that is long-acting intrauterine devices, which is nothing but LNG IUS, for contraceptive purposes to avoid unwanted pregnancies in the teenage group. If that is the case, why don't we use this for adolescents if they are having endometriosis and severe problems? How does it help? It helps in many ways. Number first, number one, it reduces the amount of bleeding. In fact, it goes for almost amenorrhea. We have to counsel the patient properly. And that would prevent the retrograde menstruation and newer implants. It is, after all, progesterone. It will antagonize estrogen. And when you antagonize estrogen, there is no COX formation. And COX will not stimulate the production of prostaglandins. So that way, everything is tackled in one go. So I personally bet on levonorgestrel, though we are a little hesitant to use this, especially in unmarried women and in that adolescent girls. It requires tremendous amount of counseling, not only to the girl, but also to her mother. So I'm underlining this. It's a, it's a, it's a definitely one thing that has to be really explored. Aromatase inhibitors are reserved for women with severe refractory endometriosis related pain often used in combination with progestins, not alone. There are disadvantages, however, that is 
bone loss with prolonged use. So we don't use aromatase anyway. Any, whenever you use anti-estrogens, it will have a bone loss. Mifeprestone, uh, uh, 104 papers over 11 years evaluated. It is difficult to judge whether mifeprestone is truly efficacious. That is the antiprogesterones. Ishre says antiprogesterones are no longer included in recommendation. So it's very clear now. What about angiogenic inhibitors? I told you it is now coming up in a big way. Endometriotic implants grow in ectopic locations with a new blood supply. VGF inhibitors, that is dopamine agonist, cabagolin 0.5 mg is used now routinely in some centers. It has got anti-angiogenic and anti-neurogenic properties, especially effective in deep infiltrating endometriosis. You can also use Anginex, rapamycin, doxycycline. I have no uh, experience with these drugs. Definitely have experience with cabagolin. Immunomodulators. Altered immune function plays a major role in genesis that we have understood. So immunomodulators decrease the inflammatory response to the disease. Loxoribin and TNF-alpha inhibitors. I have no personal experience with this. Just a theoretical slide. All these drugs help in early stages. Interferons, again, I have no experience, personal experience. They suppress the endometriosis and have been recently established uh, their efficacy. Two short regimes have been recommended, single intraperitoneal dose and three subcutaneous doses on alternate days. Endometrioma. Now, when you see a big endometrioma, whether the patient is a case of infertility or adolescent age, Usually, we hesitate to do any surgery in adolescents, uh, also even in an unmarried lady, because that will be like some sort of stigma sometimes. But however, if it is very big one, how big is, is a big question mark. Anything more than 5 centimeters probably with the symptom requires surgical removal. Cystectomy is the best option. If that cannot be done, you can use the drainage and coagulation of cyst wall. And sometimes with dense adhesions, you have to only do drainage of the cyst. Very, 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 very rarely, I mean, this particular line is not at all advocated for adolescents. This is actually for the elderly ladies. USO, BSO, TH or TLH, BSO can be considered. Ishrek guideline says post operative medical treatment may be beneficial towards the pain management and support a recommendation to offer it in women not desiring immediate pregnancy. For deep-seated, as I said, if it is asymptomatic, expectant management, but if there are urinary and bowel symptoms, medical therapy with hormone suppression is appropriate. Surgery is indicated when there is urethral or bowel obstruction. Lesions of non-reproductive organs. Of course, this is very, very difficult to tackle. You can't do some, sometimes surgery especially if it is in the lungs and other places, patient will have hemoptysis and things like that. So appropriate treatment with complication is as necessary. Basically, ovary suppression can be added to limit the disease progression or treating the pain. Surgery for neuropathic pain. Once upon a time, we used to prescribe presacral neurectomy, resection of uterosacral ligaments, and another procedure called LUNA. What does Ishri say about all these things? Luna, presacral neurectomy, and anti addition agents are no longer included in recommendations, which again means medical management is good enough. So to summarize the pain management, what is recommended is shared decision making. That's a new terminology, shared decision making. That means you include the patient in the discussion. NSAIDs and other analgesics. First line, of course, is COCs, cyclical or continuous, progesterone in different forms. But the second line is GnRH agonist plus advac therapy or even an antagonist. And for refractive pain, you can consider aromatase inhibitors in combination with the EBO. Interferons and other immunomodulators and all are in still experimental stage. What is clearly not recommended is preoperative hormones. You may use hormones after doing the surgery. No evidence as far as non-medical treatment. Surgical treatment, 
yes cystectomy or co2 vaporization similar recurrence rates excision is better than ablation presecral nephrectomy only experts can do that but it is not recommended anymore die removal center of experts only th is better than subtotal pso depending upon of course the age what is not recommended is luna and drainage and coagulation of the cyst no evidence as far as non medical treatment after exploring all our allopathic management especially with regards to chronic pain anywhere in the body the alternative therapists will say that they have a upper hand so i thought i must quickly go through in next 3 or 3 or 4 minutes what is available for endometriosis number 1 ayurveda number 2 yoga especially this asana this is called supta buddha konasana either you can do it in a sleeping uh, por uh, position like this or in a sitting posture like this of course this is uh, a joke only this asana i don't know whether is beneficial meditation especially away from the hustle bustle of the city you go and meditate and your concentration goes on that rather than on the pain naturopathy seems to be the panacea for everything green tea in green cup only is going to be helpful any other color is not going to be helpful i am joking homeopathy again they say they have treatment for everything breaky i wish i had that magical hand where i could nicely take away the pain chinese herbal medicine is very popular in china and malaysia and things like that acupuncture see how peacefully she is sleeping no pain at all acupressure does the same thing cupping stone therapy so simple seems and chiropractic massage definitely definitely helps everybody with or without endometriosis aroma therapy why not exercise definitely it releases endorphins so relief of pain tai chi is also supposed to do the same job then there are a whole lot of diet because everything depends upon the diet that's what is the recent talk in the town low glycemic diets dairy products lots of endometriotic diets and tens therapy this is one which we used to always refer to in manipal to the physiotherapy department transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation that is supposed to give quick relief so finally the standard of care for pain is not just surgery plus medicine which i told you in the beginning now we have to add one more thing that is alternative medicine in fact it becomes like a integrated therapy so you start with surgery plus allopathic medicine when it doesn't work or it stops working ayurveda homeopathy naturopathy any one of them or all of them then you also side by side prescribe yoga meditation and aroma therapy let them also have some benefit chinese herbs low glycemic diet dairy product can be a lifestyle change tai chi acupuncture exercise is another alternative that you can have when none of them work come back to allopathic medicine and keep rotating this for at least 20 25 years till she attain menopause and totally gets rid of the whole problem so i would like to conclude by saying pain is inevitable but suffering is optional so we have to look at methods to think away from pain so some and substance is pain is basically because of three mechanisms nociceptive pain inflammatory pain and neuropathic pain surgery of course improves the perception of clinical pain but there is incomplete relief so repeated surgeries are done they but they do not improve the outcome medical management is the best it involves anti inflammatory drugs hormonal therapy and gabapentin and I mean to tell in for your pain. Thank you very much for your patient listening and tolerating me again. It is Thank pleasure, you, sir, sir to tolerate you. You are always most welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Manjula. To you at the visual treats too. Uh, thank you, sir, for that extra perspective. Uh,
Uh, like within it is one a flawless minute, you uh, ready with that extemper. Excellent. So much uh, uh, really in age. 